excited about the conference presentation with Dr. Holden. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today also. So as you can see, I have PowerPoint here. Um, as mentioned, I, I recently wrote and published this book, Driving Into Infinity, Living With My Brother's Spirit. And I waited almost 35 years before writing my story. And prior to this time, only a couple of people ever knew anything about what had been going on in my life. I've spent more than 40 years uh, in the world of business in a variety of uh, managerial and executive director positions. So I was reticent to speak about the kinds of things that I had experienced because I didn't want people to think I was crazy or especially back after my brother's death that, that I was uh, just depressed or whatever and imagining things. Um, but once I retired, moved up here, and some of these friends had urged me in years before that I really needed to write this story. And I thought, I think it is time. If people don't know who I am by now, well, that's their problem. <laughs> and it's enabled me to become so much more authentic in terms of who I am and not being afraid to mention or talk about this now. So um, I've been pretty excited about having done this. But let me give you a little bit of um, background. As you can see, my brother transitioned in 1983. I'm the oldest of three children. Uh, my brother was four years younger than me. And I have a sister, also Gloria, who is 10 years younger. Um, now, in our family, we always call Don, Donnie. And to this day, I still call him that, Donnie. Um, Donnie and I, because there was only four years difference between us, essentially, we had our childhood memories together. Um, versus my sister being 10 years um, younger, by the time I was uh, 20, she had just turned 10. And so, you know, there's, there's a vast difference there. My brother and I were very close even uh, after we got grown and we had a, a really great relationship and we did always like to laugh and talk about uh, some of the crazy childhood memories that we had. But journey back in time with me now to the fall of 1982. I was 29 years old at the time. Um, there was no internet available at the time when hardly anyone had computers in offices, and certainly no one had personal cell phones. So it was a vastly different time back then. But it was then that I began to have a dream that would recur over the next year. And certainly, um, I had this one. Christina, is it working? There, it is. there we go. So in the fall of 1982, I had this dream. And the dream would always, it was always the same. And, and I'd never had a precognitive dream until that time. Uh, but it starts out and I'm outside on these expansive hills. And people are starting to gather, and pretty soon there are huge crowds there. And someone walks up to me and says, what's happening? What's, what's this all about? And I looked at this person and I said, I heard it was the end of the world. And as soon as I said that, in the sky appeared Jesus. And when that happened, I doubled over in pain, just terrible pain, but it was not physical pain. It was like mental anguish kind of pain. And I just had no idea what this meant. And I, I said to myself in this dream, I didn't think it was supposed to be this way. Isn't the end of the world supposed to be a joyous time? And then I would just 
be startled awake every time after this dream. So fast forward a year to Friday, October the 7th, 1983. And that morning, I was driving my then husband to drop him off at a meeting. And as I'm driving that morning, all of a sudden, I got this really strange, terrible hurting over my heart area. And the pain became very intense as I'm driving. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm only 30 years old. What's happening? Am I having a heart attack? Do I have a blood clot? But I didn't say anything to um, my husband then. I dropped him off. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, this pain uh, subsided. So I went on, I drove down to, and this is in Houston, I went, we were going to the, the Greek festival there, and I was meeting friends. My husband was going to ride down uh, with a friend and, and meet us there uh, a little in the afternoon. So I joined my friends, and I hadn't been at the festival very long when suddenly I saw my husband making his way through these throngs of people. This is a very popular festival, the Greek festival, and part of it was outside, and then part of it you could come into the annex of the Greek Orthodox Church there, and that's where we had migrated into, but there, there's uh, many, many people who attend that. So I see him making his way through the throngs of people there, and I'm thinking, wow, okay, he got here a little early, that's great, but as he got closer, I saw his face, and I'd never seen his face look like that before, ever. And I knew something was very, very wrong. And as he came up to me, he put both his hands on my arms, and he looked me right in the eye, and he said, Donnie was killed this morning in an accident. And at that moment that he told me that, in my mind's eye, I was seeing this picture of the earth just falling, 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 and crashing, shattering at my feet. And I just doubled over and almost fell down on the ground, and I was just screaming, no, no, no. And it was then that I knew and realized what this dream had meant, what it was trying to tell me. It was telling me about the setting, you know, throngs of people outside on these hills and uh, part of them are inside. And it was showing me the reaction I was going to have in relation to hearing about the fact my brother had been killed in an accident. It was then told to me that my brother had died in this accident that morning. It was reported at 9 a.m., which was exactly the time when I had experienced this terrible pain over my heart. So I know that his spirit was reaching out to me, and I was connected with him enough to know that something, something had happened to him, although I didn't know that was the source of why it was happening at the time. My feelings about the loss of my brother, I was destroyed. And uh, I just didn't know that a human being could cry that many tears. I just didn't know it was possible. So I want to just read a passage, one passage from my book. Every moment was sheer agony during those days with no words to adequately describe a broken heart. Nothing made sense, and everything about life was dark. I barely slept, I moved in a daze. I wanted to die every day. This terrible, impenetrable wall now separated me from ever having contact with my beloved brother again. How do you process that fact and integrate it into your life? I could not. At the burial site, I wondered how I could possibly continue living after this. 
So three days after my brother's burial, Donnie came back to me while I was driving. And this happened on Wednesday. I decided to drive to my grandparents' house and take them some of the funeral flowers uh, and just visit with them a little bit. I had stayed in Bryan, which was my hometown, and was helping my parents with writing thank you cards and things like that in relation to uh, the funeral. Um, so, and as it turned out, I actually was driving my brother's personal truck because he had been killed in the company truck. So I'm driving his truck, heading out to my grandparents, and suddenly I develop 360 degree vision as I'm driving. Now, this is happening to me and I have no idea what's going on. Uh, but just a few seconds later, I realized that my brother was there with me. He was on just behind my right shoulder here. He had his hand on my shoulder. But he was made up of light points. Uh, but I still knew it was him. But it reminded me of Star Trek when they beam people away. That's kind of how he looked. Um, and he began to speak to me telepathically. And he said, I don't want you to be sad. I'm happy now. And I'm on another plane of being. And for me, it was just simply time to go. And he said, I want to show you what it's like for me now. And at that moment, I was then no longer in my body. I was not aware of driving. Um, what happened initially was I, I saw a landscape, but it, it, it uh, looked like a photograph, almost like a negative of a photograph. And then that kind of disappeared. And then it just became all about consciousness, my consciousness and, and being there with my brother. My brother stayed with me through this entire experience. And first I experienced through this consciousness this huge peace uh, that just encompassed me. And next, I experienced that I knew everything. I knew everything in the universe and through all time. And then I became aware of this love, this energy, this power that totally encompassed me. And at that point, I truly experienced the feeling of infinity and eternity. And not only was I aware of all of these, these things, but I knew that I had become all of these things. I became this huge peace. I became uh, one with all knowledge in the universe and throughout time. And I became and I was one with love or what I term in my book as spirit. Uh, and, and this spirit, this love, is everything. There, there's nothing in the universe uh, anywhere that is not this love. And there's no separation of us or anything from it. It's right here, right now. We're in it. We're, we're part of it all the time. It's just a question of opening up to that. And I felt that I did not care one thing about going back to my body because I knew that I was home. I was part of this, this huge love that's all about creating and manifesting and we are loved, we are so loved by this energy. And it just didn't matter to me about going back. Uh, and when I began thinking like that, I began to feel as though I was wishing away, that I knew I, I needed to go on to the next level. But 
as that began to happen, my brother, speaking telepathically to me, he said, no, you can't go yet. It's not your time. And with that, I guess he used his energy to just more or less push me back down into my body. And I actually could sort of see myself coming back down into my body, and I just landed there with a thud. That's the way I felt. And my first reaction, or thought, I guess, was, wow, this is terrible. I'm, I'm so confined in this body. And I felt all glowing and happy. Uh, I knew my brother was around and he was still alive. And, and I just felt happy and at peace, like I couldn't even understand. Uh, and and when I, after I landed in my body, I realized that somehow I had made a turn onto this road that led to my grandparents' house. And I had no idea how that had happened. But I didn't say anything to my grandparents or, any, or anyone else. Um, and even though I felt really happy that day, the next day I fell back into this really deep grief because I knew I was not going to see him physically like I had and had all this interaction with him throughout my life. And uh, I, just, I just fell back into this grief. But the other thing is I knew that my life, my consciousness, my view on earth was never going to be the same after this experience. And from this experience, this is how I derived the title of my book, Driving Into Infinity, because my brother was driving when he met his transition time, and I was driving when I had this experience with him. After that, I had a lot more after-death communications from my brother. Now, I never had another out-of-body experience with him, but I did see him in my living room at home in Sugar Land, um, looking exactly as he had looked at the, the time he stayed with my husband and I one summer. He actually was not looking at me, he was peering into our stereo cabinet. <laughs> I'm going, wow, well, you know, hey, look, I'm still here. But, uh, you know, it was, it was just amazing, and it, it just happened in a flash. But to this day, I very clearly see every detail about that moment. And so I had, as I mentioned, all these other after-death communications that things happened. For example, I would come home from work, and this particular chair in our, in our dining room would be pulled out every couple of days. And I, I, I asked my husband, I said, are you coming in here and doing anything? I mean, we hardly ever went into the dining room. Then I began to realize that this was the chair my brother sat in uh, when he stayed with us. And until we sold that house, that same action continued all of, you know, every couple of days it was pulled out. And I think he was just trying to let me know he was still here for me. Uh, but other things happened in our house, such as uh, my husband and I were watching TV, and. Uh, we had a bookcase there, and up on the very top shelf, which they were very deep shelves, this video came flying out, literally flying out, and landed at our feet. Um, these were videos from our vacations and some parties. Uh, Dr. Holden had asked me, do I remember which video it was? Uh, and I said, well, no, we never thought to think, was Donnie on this video? So I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but other things that happened, I came home one day and a chair that uh, was at a desk in our master bedroom, that chair had been placed right in the middle of the doorway going into our master bedroom. And at first I was really freaked out because I thought, oh my God, is somebody in here? Have we been robbed? Are they still here? You know, I, I kind of ran around and looked at everything. But nothing else was amiss. And, uh, you know, another day I came home and there was a book lying in the hallway. We had a built-in bookcase in there. And you could see where this book had come from. Now the book was lying across the hallway from the bookcase. But you could see it had come from the bottommost shelf, which was at carpet level. So it had flown across and was still lying there. Um, my dad and his wife used to tell me that at night they would hear microwave buttons being pushed in their kitchen. 
he said, I know it's Donnie because he used to go in there and heat up food for himself and he would stay over. And my mother had a dream encounter with my brother not too long after his uh, passing. And basically he came to her in this dream as a deer. And the deer walked right up to her and she said, I knew when I saw him it was Donnie. And he came up to me and started talking to me. And she said, I looked at him and said, son, you need to come home to me right now. And the deer looked at her and said, mama, I can't come home. I'm happy now. I'm happy here. And she asked him again, but he, he said, I can't. And with that, then he turned and walked away and he disappeared. But she said that what happened, him coming in this dream, was that he took with him, he pulled out of her heart this terrible, agonizing pain that had been there since his death. And he took that with him. And she said from then on, it was what saved her um, to where she could go on living because he had come back to her. Now, some of the, I, I talked about, there are some after effects I had from my experience. Um, for example, I began to notice that when people walked into the room, it was as though I could hear their thoughts. Um, also, I experienced that when I would walk by street lights or even driving on the freeway or streets, that the lights would start going out. I also learned to see auras and I had a really wild experience. Uh, this one friend of mine who worked for me at the time in Houston, um, and this was about 2001, this happened, but she, I had read her aura and I knew there was something wrong with it. She said, well, what does it look like? And I said, well, I don't know. I've never seen anyone's aura look like this before because it was all murky and it was, uh, it was kind of this yellowish color, but not in a good way. And I said, well, it's probably just some energy blockages. But a couple of weeks after that, she became deathly ill. She was in intensive care for several weeks. Um, eventually, after she got better, she decided to go to someone uh, about energy blockages. And when she came back to the office after that, I said, hey, come on in. Let, you know, tell me what happened. So she sat down. As soon as she started talking, um, just spontaneously, this huge, non-transparent aura appeared around her. I mean, it was at least this deep on either side of her. And it was purple. And as she talked, my eyes just began weeping uncontrollably. I couldn't stop it. And she is looking at me, and I said, you have to stop. I don't know what's happening here. I've never experienced anything like this. I'm not sure what the deal is. I said, but I can't sit here and talk to you because with every word you're saying, I'm weeping. So I said, go to your office and call me on the phone. So she did. As soon as she left, you know, this weeping stopped. As soon as she called me on the phone and started talking to me, it happened all over again. It, it was just... That was a really wild experience for even me. <laughs> so eventually, though, what happened is she became a healer and a Reiki master. And uh, she's had her own uh, practice for many years, which I have been a client of hers. Um, so that, that was really one of the most interesting experiences that I had in terms of after effects. But I also have had, I've had voices that guide me on various things. But Three months, really, after my brother's death, I literally saved my family. We were staying with my dad and his wife, and my sister had come up. It saved all of us from dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. That was a very scary thing. Um, I also had received guidance when I was trying to change my career path, but there have been other guidances that I've had. So what does the research say about my experience? As I mentioned, or as Jackie mentioned, Dr. Jan Holden, um, I had 
call Dr. Holden. I was trying to get in touch with Dr. <coughs> Ring, actually, but um, when I told her why I was trying to get in touch with Dr. <coughs> Ring, uh, she, she told me, you know, you have a really unusual experience. It's so much more like a near-death experience, and I'd like to offer my services to write the afterword in your book. And she, she'd never met me. This was the first time she'd ever talked to me. And I said, wow, that would be fantastic. But um, there we go. So this is the quote I ended up getting from Dr. Kenneth Rain, an endorsement quote that's on the front of my book. Um, why that happened is because in 1985, I was searching for what had happened to me, and I was reading everything I could uh, figure out to read. And one of the books I read was by Dr. Ring, who has written a number of books about near-death experiences, and that particular book was called Heading Toward Omega. And it was the first time I had ever found a description that he happened to include in that book of a woman who had an experience that was somewhat similar to mine, but she was not near death. And he actually, when I actually did get in touch with Dr. Ring, because I told Dr. Holden, I just wanted to thank Dr. Ring for having published that book, because it just kind of saved me, like, wow, okay, I'm not crazy. Somebody else has had some kind of experience like this. Um, but when I ended up getting in touch with him and thanking him, he included Nancy Clark, whose experience was included in that book. And she's written several books also. And so both of them ended up reviewing my manuscript before I gave it to the publisher and provided endorsement quotes to me, which I can't tell you how much that meant to me. And it was hard to believe, as I told Dr. Ring, that 32 years, who would have believed that, say I read that in 85, that you know, 32, 33 years later, I would be writing a book and Dr. Ring would be providing a quote to me. It was just phenomenal my mind that that could happen. Um, but Dr. Holden in her uh, chapter at the end talks about how I have so many types of things that, that uh, mirror near-death experiences. One was the compulsion to read about spiritual matters, uh, gravitation away from organized religion and a deep secular spirituality, no fear of what we call death. I had an increase in precognitive dreams after that. Uh, of course, I mentioned electromagnetic effects, the ability to see auras, and then a feeling of being connected to something greater. So the final uh, discussion from uh, my book is talking about the integration of all of this into my life. It took years for me to get beyond the grief and, um, you know, my book details a lot more different kinds of experiences that went on over those years. Uh, but, you know, finally I was, was able to kind of pull all this together in my mind. And I talk about, uh, at the end, this, what I call, meld into spirit technique, whereby every day, you know, it's just a question of imagining that I don't have any boundaries on my physical body, and just opening myself up, connecting with this love, the spirit that's here all the time. And doing that in a way, it doesn't really matter where I am. I can be in a park walking, I can be in a crowd, um, just, just opening up to that every day. You don't have to necessarily sit and be in deep meditation, although you can do that too. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, I don't know why this is in the I like to call this conscientious consciousness. And I've defined here conscientious, you know, being faithful, careful, particular, diligent, industrious, 
just remembering to do this and then um, consciousness as being defined as the quality or state of being aware especially of something within oneself and knowledge of one's own existence so if we pay attention to that um, if we pay attention to that then we have that ability each and every day to be connected to this love, to spirit, in a meaningful, real way. Realizing that even as we sit right here, we are all a part of this energy that we can connect to and that can help us every single day. Now, um, just to mention my uh, website here, but I have, um, as Jackie mentioned, you know, the upcoming conference that will be in August and also on my blog, on my website, you'll find the ability to listen to two radio interviews that I've done over the internet, one of which is through the nderadio.org and what you have to do is when you get to the December 4th, you can go back to previous uh, episodes on there and the December 4th interview is there. You can either click on it and listen to it right there or you can download the interview and listen to that. There's a second, second one also. But essentially, I want to thank everyone today for being here and for this opportunity to again share my story. Have any questions at the moment? Thank you.